Hey everyone, my name is Brandon Robbins and welcome to Beyond the Words, where we reveal to you the context, history, and other details of scripture that will help you to understand the Bible more easily and see it in an entirely new light. Now today we're continuing a series on the book of the Bible called Mark, and we're gonna be looking at Mark chapter five. Now, as a reminder, the goal here isn't to tell you what everything means in this chapter. I really wanna allow the Holy Spirit to do that work. My goal is more to give you the tools that you need to be able to truly understand this passage when you read it for yourself, right? I'm gonna help you to understand the context, the history, the connections, and the other details that will help you to see this scripture with an entirely new set of eyes and understand it in a way that you may never have before. And there are some really amazing details that I'm gonna to reveal to you in today's passage. We're gonna look at some controversy about where some of these events actually took place. We'll take a look at something that Jesus only does once in Mark's gospel, and he does it in this chapter, and then he never does it again. And then I'm gonna show you something that blew my mind when I was studying this chapter, something that totally changes the way that you see one of Jesus's miracles. And then finally, if you stick around to the end, I will show you how all of these miracles are actually connected to one another and then give you some next steps that you can take to apply these things that you've learned today. So it, it's gonna be great. Grab a notebook and something to write with and let's get started. So as we enter into chapter five, Jesus and his disciples have just finished crossing the Sea of Galilee. Now, if you remember, as they were crossing the sea at the end of the last chapter, there was a huge storm that Jesus had to calm. And the chapter ended with the disciples saying, who is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Now, here's why I want you to notice this. Jesus' disciples still don't quite understand who he is, right? He's their rabbi, and many of them might even believe that he's the Messiah, but they don't fully understand what that means. And that's going to matter as we encounter some other people in this chapter later on. So when Jesus and his disciples cross the Sea of Galilee, it says that they go to a region of the Gerasenes, or the Gadarenes, or the Gergesenes. I mean, if you look at the footnotes of your Bible, you'll probably notice a note that says that some of the biblical manuscripts have different names for where Jesus and his disciples land. And the interesting thing is that all of these locations are real places. Gadara, which would be the region of the Gadarenes, is about five miles from the Sea of Galilee over in this area. Gerasa, which would be the region of the Gerasenes, is really far away. It's 37 miles away over here. And finally, there's Gergesa, which is right here, next to the Sea of Galilee. Now, as you'll shortly see, some of the events that occur in this story show us that this is really the only likely place that these events could have taken place. And you'll understand what I mean when we get to that part. What all of these locations have in common, though, and this really matters, is that they are in Gentile territory, which means an area made up of mostly non-Jewish people. And the fact that all of these areas are very conspicuously non-Jewish tells us something important about what Jesus is doing here. You see, Jewish people generally didn't associate with Gentiles. Gentiles were considered unclean. But more than that, Jewish people believed that the Messiah was coming for them. Right, the Messiah was their Messiah who was coming to save them and to kick the Gentile rulers out. And yet here Jesus is expanding his ministry to reach the Gentiles. I mean, this, this is a huge deal. No one expected this. Early Jewish audiences hearing this story would have been shocked and confused by this. I mean, what is a Jewish rabbi doing going into Gentile territory? And more importantly, what is this man who you tell me is the Messiah doing in Gentile territory? I mean, this is a big deal. Jesus is reaching those who aren't supposed to be reached. He's expanding his ministry to reach everyone. And, and let's just take a moment to think about that. Jesus wasn't supposed to reach people like you and me. I mean, have you ever let that sink in? Unless you're a part of the Jewish community, the Messiah wasn't meant for us. At, at least that's what most people believed. And yet Jesus is revealing to us something huge about God's love. God's love doesn't leave anyone out. 
I mean, let me ask you, have you ever been made to think that you weren't worthy of God's love? Has anyone ever told you that you don't count? Have you ever been told that, you know, maybe you didn't belong in a church? Or have you ever been part of a church that told other people they weren't welcome and it just hits you the wrong way? Well, that's because Jesus is making it clear here that none of that is true. Jesus has come for all of us, even the worst of us. And we're about to see that in a big way in a second. You see, soon after Jesus and his disciples arrive, they encounter this man who is possessed by demons. And it's really important that we pay attention to how this man is described in these verses, because there's more detail given about this man than usual. And what we see is that this man is so consumed by this demonic possession that he's almost lost his humanity. He's chained like an animal, but the chains can't hold him. He's been kicked out of society. He can't even associate with people. I mean, you want to talk about Jesus coming to reach the worst of us? This man is one of the worst. But look at what happens. I mean, this is so crazy. The man runs and kneels before Jesus. This man, who is possessed by demons, bows before Jesus. This is an act of worship. A demon-possessed man worships Jesus. Jesus just calmed a sea in front of his disciples, and their response was, who's this guy? Right? But this possessed man knows who Jesus is. And, and then, then this is where things get really interesting. And, and this is what blew my mind. Jesus asks the man what his name is. And the possessed man responds, legion. Now, there are a lot of theories about what legion means, right? But one thing is for sure, it's not a proper name. Legion could be a reference to the number of demons that the man has inside of him. I mean, at full strength, a Roman legion consisted of 6,000 infantry and 120 cavalry. In other words, this man is possessed beyond comprehension. I mean, no wonder chains can't hold him. No wonder he's lost all semblance of humanity. But the closer you look at the text and the context, the more you realize that there's probably also something else going on here. You see, at the end of this exchange between Jesus and the possessed man, the demons beg to be cast out of the man and into a herd of pigs, numbering about 2,000. And so, so pay attention to that, right? 2,000 pigs. One thing this tells us is that Jesus is definitely in Gentile territory. I mean, pigs were considered unclean, and you would have never found 2,000 pigs in a Jewish town. But there's something way deeper going on with this detail of 2,000 pigs. Because you know what bore the image of a pig in that region at the time of Jesus? The standard of the 10th Roman legion. Their symbol was a boar. And guess what else? That word legion, it can also be used to describe a battalion. And guess how many soldiers are in a battalion? About 2,000. The 10th Roman Legion had been stationed in Judea since 6 BC. They controlled the region. They oppressed the people. So many times they had stripped people of their humanity. I mean, you see, when you, when you look closer, you see that Jesus is doing way more than just healing a possessed man here. This healing has revolutionary undertones. Jesus is showing that he has the power to remove 2,000 boars from this region. Jesus, the Messiah, has the power, if he wants to, to remove Rome. And notice how these pigs are removed. They dive off a cliff and are swallowed up by the sea. Now, this is how we know that this event is happening in Gergesa. Right? This is the only town of those listed that is near the sea. But even more than that, think of the imagery that Jewish people would picture as they heard this story. Thousands of boars, thousands of Roman soldiers, Roman soldiers with weapons and chariots being swallowed up by the sea. I mean, that sounds an awful lot like a particular scripture, one where thousands of years ago, thousands of Egyptians with weapons and chariots were being swallowed up by the sea as God freed the Israelite people from slavery in Egypt. Jesus is declaring something powerful here. He's saying he is God in the flesh who is here to free the people. The story of Exodus was central to Jewish identity and Jesus places himself at the center of the story. He is the only one who can truly save the people. But then once Jesus does this, something else amazing happens, something that never again happens in Mark's gospel. Jesus tells the man to tell other people. 
I mean, if you remember, every other time Jesus has performed a miracle, Jesus tells people to keep it quiet. And, th- and that's what Jesus does throughout the rest of the gospel, right? But here, Jesus tells him to spread the word of what the Lord has done for him. Why would he do this? Well, think about where Jesus is. He's in Gentile country. There are no Jewish religious leaders around to get upset about him healing people or calling himself the Messiah. And because Jesus allows this word to spread, it sets up for what is about to happen next in this chapter. See, because once Jesus and his disciples leave and travel back across the Sea of Galilee, people are going to be ready for him. Now, before we jump into this final section, I actually want to pause for a second. And if you're liking this video so far, I want to invite you to click that thumbs up and the subscribe button and let YouTube know. Right? These are things that will encourage YouTube's algorithm to send this video to even more people and allow us to help even more people to dive deep into God's word. And so thank you for doing that. Now, now, like I said earlier, in this final section, I'm going to reveal to you how all of the miracles in this story are connected. And we're actually about to encounter two more miracles in just a moment. And then if you stick around to the end, I'm going to give you four action steps for how you can apply these teachings today. So stick with us. Okay, so back to the passage. Like I said, after Jesus heals the man in Gergesa, he travels back across the Sea of Galilee. Now, Mark doesn't tell us exactly where Jesus goes, but one likely place would be Capernaum. I mean, since that's Jesus's home base. Regardless of where he goes, though, we know that Jesus is back in a Jewish area because Mark tells us that a synagogue leader comes to ask Jesus for help healing his dying daughter. And the synagogue leader doesn't just come to talk to Jesus. Mark says that this religious leader fell at Jesus' feet, just like the possessed man did. Now, again, this is no small thing for so many reasons, right? First, he's falling at Jesus' feet. He's in this posture of worship. This matters. Second, he's a religious leader. He's used to people coming to him for help, but now he's begging Jesus. And then third, he's a religious leader. And the last time that we saw religious leaders, they were conspiring against Jesus. But now he's worshiping him. I mean, this is an incredibly ironic moment. I mean, if it was weird for Jesus to go into Gentile territory, it's just as weird for him to come back and have the first person who approaches him be a religious leader. But Mark's not done. Right? Because just as this religious leader has come bowing before Jesus, asking for help, it says that a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years comes seeking help from Jesus. Now, what you need to understand about this woman's condition is that whatever the cause of this bleeding, it's made her unclean for 12 years. Which means that she hasn't been able to interact with her community for 12 years. Just like the possessed man, she's been an outcast. And she thinks to herself, she said, she thinks to herself, if I can just touch his cloak, I'll be healed. She believes in Jesus's power. Maybe she's heard the account of the possessed man that just happened not too long ago. Or maybe she's heard the account of the man with leprosy that Jesus healed in the first chapter of Mark. If you remember, it said that all he had to do to be healed was to just touch Jesus. But either way, This woman's entrance into our story suddenly starts to bring all of these pieces together. Whereas Jesus' disciples saw him calm the storm and responded, Who's this guy? The woman, the religious leader, and the possessed man all have faith in who Jesus is. The woman and the religious leader both use the word sozo when asking Jesus for healing. But sozo doesn't mean just healed. It also means saved. All of these people believe that Jesus can save them. But there's more, right? After Jesus heals the woman, it says that she falls at his feet, just like the religious leader did, just like the possessed man did. Each and every one of these people immediately falls and worships Jesus. I mean, just think about how significant this is. The fact that each of these people lays down at Jesus's feet, puts them all on the same level. The possessed man, the sick woman, the religious leader, they are all the same in the eyes of Jesus. Other people might look down on them. They might even have looked down on each other. But here is this powerful truth that this moment shows us. You can't look down on someone 
when you're laying at the feet of Jesus. Let me say that again. You can't look down on someone when you're laying at the feet of Jesus. You can't judge from on high when you are bowed low. I mean, this chapter is a powerful reminder that we are all the same at the foot of the cross. And no matter what position we're in, we all need Jesus to be our Savior. He is Lord and we are his servants and we all should be like the people in this story, bowing before him, worshiping him, looking to him for our salvation, humbling ourselves before him and one another. I mean, that's the message of this chapter that I don't want you to miss. We need to come before Jesus each day, ready to worship him. And here's what that means, because we see a very clear picture of what worship looks like in this chapter. In order to worship Jesus, we have to first humble ourselves before Jesus. We need to bow before him. We need to honor him, recognize who Jesus truly is. We're not the savior, right? He's the savior. But humbling ourselves also means something else. We also need to humble ourselves before one another. I mean, let me ask you, where do you look down on other people? Where do you have prejudice in your heart? Where in your life are you judging others? Who do you consider yourself better than? Who do you hold a grudge against? I mean, that's, that's why Jesus later tells us that when we come seeking God in prayer, we have to forgive others, right? You can't humble yourself when you're holding a grudge against someone else, right? The very nature of that puts you above them. And so we need to remember that we are all on the same level when we are bowed at the foot of the cross. And so where do you need to humble yourself today? And then finally, the other thing we learn in this passage is that in order to truly worship Jesus, we have to come seeking what only he can give. I mean, that's what everyone in these stories has in common, right? They come seeking what only Jesus can give. Jesus isn't just a savior, he's the savior. He's the one who can overthrow Rome. He's the one who can cast out demons. He's the one who can heal 12 years of bleeding. And he's the one who will bring a religious leader's 12-year-old daughter back to life. Jesus isn't just an amazing rabbi. He's the Messiah. And he offers us a salvation that no one else can give us. And so let me end by asking you, have you been seeking what only Jesus can give. Because the truth is you can find a lot of moral teachers out there who can give you some great life lessons. And you can find lots of people who will tell you to love other people and help others. And Jesus does all of that. But those aren't the things that only Jesus can offer. Only Jesus can truly heal us inside and out. Only Jesus truly frees us from the sin in our lives. Only Jesus can mend our relationships that we think are completely destroyed, including our relationship with God. Only Jesus can fill that void in your life that nothing else has been able to fill. Only Jesus can make us new and transform our hearts. Only Jesus conquered the grave and only Jesus can give us eternal life. And so let me ask you again, are you seeking what only Jesus is offering? Because if you are, then I want to invite you to receive it today. I want to pray for you right now. And it's a simple prayer, but it's a sincere one. It's a prayer that seeks what only Jesus can offer. And a prayer that I hope helps you to begin or to continue a relationship with Jesus that will truly transform your life forever. And so please pray with me right now. And like I said, after the prayer, I'm going to give you some action steps on how you can apply all of this. But right now, let's just pray. Jesus, we come before you right now and we lay ourselves at your feet. We confess that we are no better than that religious leader or the sick woman or the possessed man were. We're all sinners in need of your grace. We're all broken in need of your healing. And so we lay our hearts before you right now. We surrender our lives to you and we ask you to do what only you can do. Heal us, save us. Just as you rose from the grave, give us new life with you at the center. 
For you are our Messiah, our Lord, our Savior. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Okay, like I said, I want to give you some action steps for how you can begin to apply these teachings immediately. And so here they are. The first step is to read Mark 5 all the way through. All right, now that you have all of this information, go read the whole chapter with a fresh set of eyes. See what jumps out at you that you've never seen before. And then once you do, I want to invite you to take a step further. Your second action step is to invite three people to watch this with you and discuss it together. So go ahead and watch this video again, right? Pick up on things that you missed watching it the first time. But this time, I want you to do it with other people. Right? Maybe you've got a couple of friends or some people in your church or some people online, right? But we always learn more with others and they will pick up on things that you missed. And so allow this to be an opportunity for God to reveal even more to you. And then the third thing, humble yourself before someone else this week. Right? This may actually be the toughest action step that I give you, but the truth is this chapter is all about worshiping Jesus and that requires us to humble ourselves. And so maybe that means that you need to call someone up and offer them forgiveness. Maybe you need to seek forgiveness from someone, or maybe you need to surrender a prejudice and talk to someone who you didn't want to associate with in the past. Either way, for these lessons to stick, we've got to apply them. And to find a way to live this one out. Now, finally, before I give you your last action step, I just want to take a moment to say thank you so much for watching these videos. Your support means so much to me. I mean, I can't even tell you how much you mean to me, but I truly, truly do appreciate it. And I want you to know that. Now, the last action step that I want you to take is I want you to click this video right here and I want you to watch Mark 1 all over again. Now that you've gotten five chapters in, there may be things that you didn't even notice in the first few videos that are going to jump out all over again. And so go back and watch that video. Leave me some comments down below about what you're learning. And until next week, have a great week and God bless.